All right. So uh, what's the topic today? What is it that you were to do the reading on and what is it we're going to be talking about? If you don't know the answer, you can look at the syllabus. Security and cyberspace. Yeah, security and cyberspace, or to cut things more simple, cyber security. When you see this phrase, cyber security, what do you think of? And there's not a right or wrong answer here. Just what sorts of things pop into your head? Really any type of security that deals with the internet or um, like computers in general. So we're talking about computer security. So what sorts of issues do you think are going to arise in this? Hackers, virus. Okay, so hacking is one. What are some other sorts of issues that you think might come up? Viruses. Viruses, hacking, viruses. What else? Spyware. Spyware, yeah. Malware of all general sorts. Anything others, anything else that anyone wants to throw up here? So privacy is connected in for sure. So privacy issues and the connections between privacy and security. So I'm glad this one came up, Cynthia, because we're going to be focusing more closely on privacy next week. It's going to be the main focus. However, you cannot talk about security without some concerns of privacy, and you cannot talk about privacy without security coming into it. And we'll also see um, next or two or three weeks from now, um, there's going to be another issue that ties in with this. So we've got privacy, security, and then we kind of think of it as a triangle. Here's privacy, here's security. Anyone know what the third side we'll be talking about after that is? When somebody hacks in, very often they are committing a what? Crime. A crime. So cyber crime will be our third one. And you all of these intertwine, but they can also be all teased apart and talked about separately. So we're going to be talking about cybersecurity today, which means we are going to be addressing all these issues of hacking. We're going to be talking about viruses, what they are, what spyware is, what malware in general is, and also pointing towards next week what some of the privacy concerns are. But before we do that, um, this is a philosophy class. And like all good philosophy classes, that means we need to define things and take something that seems rather simple and make it more complicated. So what is the definition of cybersecurity or how should we understand cybersecurity? So um, the phrase cybersecurity breaks into two parts. Ah, uh, what are they? Well, you can see them, cyber security. Now, what did we say cyber was a few weeks ago when we were talking about cyber ethics? What sorts of things are cyber? What does this term mean? Digital. Yeah, digital or anything related to computers. So when we're talking about cybersecurity, all we're talking about is security in the realm of cyberspace or dealing with computers. So if we're gonna understand what cybersecurity is, half our job is done. Now we just need to ask ourselves, what do we mean by security? And very often, this is one of those terms that we all have a general common sense understanding of, but we don't really have a definition at all times. And it's useful to understand what parts go into security in general. So we can then see that cybersecurity is just an example of that. And also by understanding what it takes to make something secure, we can see why computer security or cybersecurity is so difficult to achieve in comparison to other types of security. So security in general, there's no hard and fast definition of it, but the book gives three parts that I think are useful um, guidelines or useful way of thinking of security. And they have there's three words. So anyone from the reading or uh, off the top of their head or want to take a guess what the things that go into security are. So to achieve security, you achieve these three things. Confidentiality. Confidentiality is the first one. Did you say the second one, Marcus? I couldn't hear you. Uh, integrity. Yo, oh, yes. yes. Integrity. Um, can I chime in? Availability. Availability, yes. Availability. I sometimes also call this accessibility. I never remember which one's really the term, but either one works. So if you have these three things, a system has these three things. It has confidentiality, 
integrity, and availability or accessibility, it will be secure. Now, what do each of these things mean? When something's confidential, what does that mean? No third party it's or unauthorized. It's private and third parties, and specifically it has to do with information slash knowledge. So when something is confidential, what that means is the only individuals or people or groups that have access to the information contained there are the people who are supposed to. So for instance, your social security card is something you want confidential. You don't want everyone knowing your social security number. Another thing that uh, is tied in with confidentiality is, you know, um, certain things like what you did this weekend. You might want that information confidential from your parents, or you might want this sorts of information confidential from your teachers. What are some other sorts of classic cases of confidential information? Give you a clue. Uh, the acronym has some. Yeah, therapy is a great one, Cynthia. So anything you talk to with a doctor or a therapist, you don't want that information going out. You don't want your therapist like starting a blog called like things David Neely talked to me about today in therapy. Let's analyze him as a group. That's not something you want to do. So that's all we mean by confidential is basically, you can think of it like this. Um, if here is a system, the first thing you want to do is make sure that there's nothing on the outside that can see in or gain information on the inside. So that's an eyeball. So a great piece of confidentiality in your house is the wall. A wall, unless you live in a house with glass walls, gives you a lot of confidentiality. If you walk around naked in your house and have the blinds down, no one can see. You have confidentiality. Your house is a confidential system. Now, what is integrity? What does it mean for something to have integrity? Either in the sense in which, um, yeah, Anwan says data is not manipulated by unauthorized persons or software. So this is about information being seen. Integrity is about information being um, manipulated or changed. It can come into the system and change things. So somebody looking into your house is not going to affect the integrity of the system. They're not inside. However, if somebody was inside the house, they could instead move things around. So that's what we mean. A system has integrity when there's nothing on the inside moving things or changing things other than people have access to um, somebody who's allowed to have access to those things. Now, very often, integrity and confidentiality go hand in hand. However, they don't have to. So for instance, um, I'm going to draw something on the board. Tell me what it is. A bug? Yeah, a bug. Specifically, this is my best drawing of a cockroach. Cockroaches are something that violate either integrity or confidentiality. Which one does a cockroach violate? In your physical house. Integrity. Confidentiality. Yeah. Oh. It, in, it affects your integrity because it can literally come in and eat your food, poop everywhere. But does it gain any information about you and your skills? Not really. It's a cockroach. It doesn't have a brain. It can't go on TMZ and post things about you. It can't, like, if you were a celebrity and you saw a paparazzi at the window, you'd be way more worried about your secrets getting out. A cockroach can't do that. But a cockroach can get inside and actually make differences. Same with mice. Part of the reason we hate mice so much is they bite into our food. They affect the integrity of a system. The bug also affects the integrity, but these things do not affect confidentiality. However, something on the outside, like somebody with a camera, a telescope, they can affect the confidentiality of what's going on in your house. They can know what's going on, but they can't do anything to change it. So a system is secure when nobody's gaining that information and nobody's getting inside like a bug would. So then there's the third part, availability or accessibility. So what does this mean? What does it mean for something to be available or something to be accessible? Allowed to all. Yeah, so accessible or available is the opposite in some sense of these two. It's about having 
access to something. So for instance, you all, if we were in person, would have access to John Jay's building. And you, by having access, that means you're allowed to be there. So the third part of a secure system is that things that need to be um, accessed and the people who want to access them can get access. So security is kind of like a balancing act where a system's only properly secured when it's confidential and integral from everyone who shouldn't get in, but also there's access for people who do want it. And most importantly, any sort of uh, resource that the system needs to run can access and get into that system. So for instance, a computer to work can be perfectly secure and like keep out all the information, all the integrity and everything else. And what's the quickest way to make sure that nobody ever accesses your computer? What's the quickest way to make sure nobody can ever hack in, get to it or anything else? Not to use it. Yeah, not to use it. Or if you take a sledgehammer and smash it, that's the quickest way of doing it. If your computer is in 30,000 parts, nobody is ever going to use that computer. However, the downside is you can't use that computer. The computer can't get what it needs. So if your goal is to keep your information secure, you need to make sure that your computer system continues to have the things that it has. It has to have access to things like power. It needs to have access to things like um, a continued existence of your hard drive. It needs to make sure that it can continue spinning or reading or et cetera. So a secure system is not just one that other people don't have information and can't affect. It's also one in which the system itself gets the access of resources it needs and the people who want that information can, or not want that information, but should have access to that information still have it. So I think to highlight what is a perfectly secure system and the sort of situation, imagine that tomorrow COVID mutates and not like these tiny little mutations we've been talking about that might affect the vaccines. I mean, the mutation turns you into a zombie and everybody who gets COVID turns into a zombie and there's no cure and they're gonna start trying to eat your brains. Now, if the zombie apocalypse started tomorrow, where would you go personally? Describe the place you would go to. A forest. A forest. Um, where else might you go, Jorge? Um, people, like, they, I mean, for me, uh, you feel like you're safer at home. So, you know, it's like a lot of people would just stay home. We've got home. We've got a forest. Where else might you go? A bunker would be very nice. Bunker. And by bunker, we just mean like an underground locked door. So let's highlight why is it that you might, well, let's start with forest because that was the first one said. Why might you want to go to a forest? What is it about a forest? Isolation. Isolation. So if you're on your own and you're isolated, what do you have? Well, there's no one around. So all your information is still yours. Also, you have integrity. If there's no zombies around, no one can affect you. If there's no zombies around, no one's getting information about you. They don't know where you are to eat you. Also, what are there a lot of in forests? It's hard to get access to the, to the forest. Yeah, so, one, so one thing that's good about the forest is that it's hard for other people to get access. But on the flip side, it also has a downside of why the force might not be ideal. Well, other people can't get there, but can you get access to the things you need? Well, basically, it depends on how um, skilled you are as a hunter. If you can hunt and kill, this deer doesn't have a neck, but pretend it had a neck. Well, if this deer has a neck and you know how to hunt, then you also have access to food and water. The downside is, though, there's no walls or anything. So if the zombie apocalypse spreads, eventually you're going to lose that integrity and lose that confidentiality. Houses and bunkers, what are the advantages there? Well, how does a house provide you with confidentiality? Uh, professor, it might give you a sense of security. It, it could be false sense, you know, but this, this is just how you feel. Yeah, so I think that's a good thing to um, highlight because we're going to come back to it of sense of security versus actual security. But 
I mean, houses are more so staying home is going to be better than like standing in Times Square looking upwards. What is it home has that Times Square doesn't? Same thing with a bunker. An enclosed place. Say that again. It's like an enclosed place with like four yeah, walls around you. There are walls. And walls are a great, probably the greatest invention of all time for confidentiality and integrity. If you have good walls, the zombies can't get in. So that's why you have confidentiality and integrity. However, the downside of being at home or being in a bunker is what? What is the downside, especially in the case of a bunker? So now you cannot leave. You can't leave. And for a, you, that should be okay for a bit, but what is eventually going to happen? You have to go out to get supplies. Yeah, you got to get food. You got to get water. You, If it's an airtight bunker, you could literally run out of air. Yes, yeah, Christopher says um, limited resources. So that's the overall issue. And this is why security is a balancing act. You have to make sure that you have these levels, but the things that give you more confidentiality confidentiality and integrity very often also re reduce the amount of accessibility for everybody. So including you and the supplies you need. So for a system to be properly secure, that it's actually a usable but secure system, you need to balance between them. You need to make sure that access is available to those who need it and that access is not available to anyone on the outside who wants your information or wants your things or to affect your things. So everyone just understand like the general background of what we mean by security. This shouldn't be too complicated. It's like your everyday sense of security. All right, and why do we want security? What is it about security? Well, security goes along with another S word, S-A-F-E, um, safety. Safety and security go hand in hand. So we like to be secure so we stay safe because we don't want to be in pain. We don't want our things stolen. So um, that's what we mean by security. Now, give me one second. So security is something that can exist in the physical world and also in a cyber world. However, in your physical world, instances in which security is violated or security is um, lost or systems not being secure seems less common than in the cyber realm. So for instance, um, how many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you have had your house broken into? Anybody? Okay, one out of almost, we have an almost and a yes. So we have one almost, one yes, and a lot of no's. How many of you have had a computer system of yours, either a password stolen, something hacked, something where you had to gain? Me. Some, say that again, Yaris. No, I said me. <laughs> yeah, I have as well. So that makes at least two of us. Anybody else? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so it looks like what we see is hacking, like we can have security uh, violations in both the, the cyber realm, and in the physical realm. But when you look at it, what you see is in terms of numbers, the number of cyber security uh, issues is generally much higher than the number of physical issues. And if you go into the news and you see like major hacks, it's even more. Every once in a while, like if there's a neighborhood burglar who robs five houses, it gets into the news as like, this is the worst burglary we've had in a while. There's strings of burglaries going around. And then you hear about like a security hack at a credit card company. And what are we talking about in terms of number of security violations? Uh, more people get are more affected with um, cyber hacks than physical. Yeah, it seems like the sheer numbers. And when we're talking about numbers, it's huge number differences. So for instance, when, um, when the, uh, so there was a big hack at Target, I guess this was about six years ago now. Um, anyone know how many credit card numbers were stolen? Fifty million. Fifty million is a lot bigger than like a dozen people breaking into some houses in your neighborhood. Like even if we were to take every single burglary of a car or a house in New York City that happens in a year, very often a single cyber attack will 
put more people at risk. Like there's probably not 50 million burglaries, house burglaries and car burglaries in New York City each year. Like that would be incredibly high. However, there are 50 million hacks of a particular computer system, sometimes in a single day. So here's the simple question. If, if both cybersecurity and physical security involve keeping systems confidential, into having into blah, 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 having integrity and making sure that the people who need access have the access. Why is cybersecurity so much harder than physical security? So why is cybersecurity so hard? And this is really what we're going to be talking about for the rest of class, putting it all in this context of if we need cybersecurity and everyone knows we need cybersecurity, why the hell does it seem like there's a new hack every single day? Yeah, it's because it's created by humans. So there's going to be four different factors that I want to highlight. And so first off, there's a sense in which cybersecurity is created by humans, but also walls are did my screen just get blurry? Do I need to shut off the camera? I uh, got a little bit blurry. Yeah, sometimes it does this. All right, so walls, doors, houses are also made by people. So what is it about cybersecurity that separates it from regular security? Part of it is both of them are made by humans. So what is it about the case of cyber that makes it different? What is it about the fact that it's made by humans makes it much more susceptible to security violations? You can't physically see it or touch it. There's physical differences. So that's number one. What is number two? Anyone know? It's online. So online in terms of the physical differences is one. So there are physical differences having to do with where it is. And another thing with it's online. So it's online is actually going to be connected to both of these, but I'm going to take um, this one here and run with it, which is it wasn't um, computers weren't designed for this. Um, so there's another thing which we're going to come back to is the way computers were designed initially and the way they're built is generally not geared towards security in the way that a house is by its very nature something that we're thinking about security on. All right, there's two more things I want to highlight. Any others? This one's kind of tied in with this first one. And this is, um, so MD says uh, bugs and other sorts of things. So there are not just physical differences, it's much more technically difficult. And then four is gonna be, and this one kind of ties in with all the others, is um, average person understands it less. So these are, that's, I turned an S into a Z. Um, the word after weren't is designed. Thank you, Cynthia. That, that is the worst designed ever, but it's supposed to say, designed, perfect. All right, so these are the four things that we're gonna talk about. So what I wanna do now is begin with the technical difficulties ones. We're actually gonna start here. And then once we've understood this and how that leads to security issues, we can then move on to the other ones. Um, and in some ways, these aren't gonna be super clearly differentiated, but rather what we're gonna have is each and every one um, is gonna tie in with the others. Also, if at any point I get blurry up here on screen again, somebody just type blur in the chat or just shout, hey, you're blurry again, just as it seems to be being a little uncooperative today. All right, everyone on, on board with what the game plan is, where we're now going to talk about why cybersecurity is so damn hard. All right. 
So, ah. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's start with number two. Computers weren't designed for this shit. So what do I mean by that? So anyone know the history of the computer? It, at was, all? Basically, it was basically made to uh, perform calculations. Yeah. The earliest computers were just designed, they were basically gigantic calculators. And all they did was run computer calculations, the sorts of things that computers are still able to do. Like computers today can do everything that an early computer could do, but then more. And so that's the, they were basically just simplistic. I mean, the first ones were the size of a room and all they do is like basic computations, like a calculator could do but like an early simple calculator, not like your TI-89 plus silver edition or anything like that. Um, so with these early computers, they were so big and so powerful that the only people who had access to them were universities and they built them in the university and nobody could get access to them. Starting in about the 1970s, the personal computer started to be affordable for some people. And then it continued to get more and more affordable until I remember my family got the first, their first computer in like the early 1990s. And my school had a whole bunch when I was as early as like kindergarten. So by that point, computers were basically everywhere. But even here, the internet was not something we had early on. The internet only, I mean, it existed, but it was only being used in small areas. So the internet in the sense that it exists today of complete communication with everybody, was not a thing for at least the first 20, 25 years of personal computers and 50 years before that. Now, why is this worth highlighting in the case of security? Well, back in the day when the internet didn't exist, who could access any, a particular computer? What did you have to do to access a computer? Be super rich or be with the government. And say you then access, you owned it, or you had a right to it. Where did you have to go to access your information? Uh, that physical. Area. You had to go to a physical location. So if you wanted to steal information off of one of these computers, what would you have to do? Got to break into where it is. You had to physically break into a location. So you had a house like this. And so basically what that meant was that cybersecurity was the same thing as physical security in the early days. So no one had this idea that a computer system could be accessed in any way other than just walking up to the computer and hacking into it. So what this meant is early computers were being made with the assumption that nobody would ever be able to access it except directly at the computer. So the sorts of security issues that exist today were just not even considered. And like so many other pieces of technology, what ends up happening is that when, once things like the internet started coming out, did somebody go, whoa, wait, we need to start over because our computers weren't designed for this. They were designed to deal with like sitting alone in the house and we don't have that anymore. Now you can access computers from anywhere in the world. We need to start over. Did anybody say that? Did anybody say, no, we need to throw out all the computers now the internet? No. No, what did they do? They just started building on top of the technology that already existed. And because of this, the personal computer that we have today is built on top of a system that didn't have security in mind. And so part of the reason cybersecurity is so damn hard is it's basically just putting a band. What we're trying to do is put band-aids on like a gaping wound. The system was not designed to be inaccessible to other users because there was no sense of other users having access to that computer. Instead, it was just built with the assumption that, well, no one's ever gonna connect to this, so we don't need anything. Nowadays though, we have connectivity all over the entire world thanks to the internet, but we have a bunch of computers that were not designed for that to be the case. So we instead, if this is your computer, instead of it just being the case of the computer itself, is secure, we instead have to start building things on top of it. So the computer is designed one way and then we have to start sticking stuff on. And as anybody who's ever tried to like attach something to something else after it's already made, like if you're trying to glue something onto something, it's not gonna stick as well as if it was made for that. Like if you buy an Ikea dresser and something falls off, if you try to glue it, it's never gonna be as secure as the original piece of furniture was. 
So that's really one of the major issues with computers is they were not designed to have the level of connectivity that we see. The level of connectivity we see with the internet and other things is so far beyond what anyone envisioned that the actual hardware and the actual setup of a computer is not designed to deal with it. So everyone on board with why that's such a worry. And so whenever you hear like cybersecurity, well, it's generally not, that is not a big issue for people. Uh... In the original design. Nowadays, yeah. what we're stuck with is that people are trying to scramble to make up for the fact that that is now a major issue. Now that we are connected, everyone is scrambling to try to make networks secure. But the basic, it's basically like try to make a house secure, but all the bricks have holes in them because the bricks were never designed to build a wall. Now that we have this, these bricks, we're trying to build a wall and nobody's inventing new bricks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so, awesome. So yeah, we're at the point of just like, we are scrambling for time to try to make up for the fact that we don't have the building blocks we need to make a perfectly secure system from the ground up. Which leads into the second thing. Technically more complex. So what do I mean by this? Well, compare a house with a computer system. What do you need to keep someone out of your house? An alarm system? Secured lock? Even more so than alarms, you need locks and you need walls. And that's about it. And bars on the windows, maybe. But basically, as long as you physically do that, it's secure. And not only that, um, if a wall is working, it's pretty clear to everybody. Like I could show you a wall and you'd be able to be like, yeah, that wall is not secure. It's got a giant hole in it. Or that wall looks secure. It doesn't have any holes in it. Or this wall looks very secure. It's made out of 20 foot thick stone. A lock, you can check to see if the lock is locked or not. And you can like, well, the inside mechanism of a lock is pretty sophisticated. Like, I don't know how to lock pick and I don't know if any of you are locksmiths, but I know it's a rather sophisticated mechanical system. But to use a lock is quite straightforward and simple. And it's basically like you're either secure or you're not. And as long as you keep the entire perimeter of the house secure, then you're basically gonna have a secure house. What's the difference with a computer? And especially with a modern computer, well, there's a lot of different parts that go into a modern computer system. So what all do you need to take into account to keep your computer system secure? So let's start off, here's your computer. What all is a part of your computer? What all do you have to worry about here? Uh, internet. Uh... So yeah, one thing is you are gonna be connected to the outside world in a way that you are not for a physical computer. And not only are you connected to the outside world, you're connected everywhere. So it's not just like you have a, you have a good idea of what, with a physical house, you have a good idea of where somebody could be coming from. With a computer system, it's technically more complex in that it has connections to an entire outside world. Also associated with this is your computer inside is itself complicated. So you've got the hard drive, you've got the, the um, CPU, you've got uh, all the software you're running, which is installed there. And each of these things is itself something that could in theory be a security risk. In a house, it's basically just the walls, the windows, the doors. With a computer, if somebody builds a faulty CPU, theoretically, they could access it. If somebody uh, has given you software with bugs in it, then that is another possible way to access the computer. Um, the operating system, yeah, that's running the software that's installed on the hard drive is another thing. If there's any gaps in that, it can be much more difficult. Um, and it's what, so what we need to do when there's all of these different things, each one needs different solutions to the potential attacks. With a wall and windows and doors, they're all basically the same, just make them hard and strong. But what you need to keep your software safe 
is going to be somewhat different from what you need to keep your computer system or the CPU safe, which is going to be different from what you need to make sure that you have safe connections with other computers. Um, also, a difference because information is going out. The information that's stored on your computer isn't just stored on your computer because every time you access the internet or take in stuff from the internet, all of this is also something that could theoretically uh, be accessed by somebody else. So in the same way, like uh, if you're if you're in your house, you're safe, but you you aren't talking to the outside world. But by its very nature, computers are generally always connected to the outside world. So it's not just technically complex in terms of um, each individual part. It's also just there's more technical complexity in terms of how many different parts there are to accessing and checking to make sure that things aren't getting in that aren't supposed to be there and are getting out that are supposed to go out um, and aren't getting out if they're not supposed to get out. So when you actually look at a computer system, instead of a house, which is just like a single particular unit, what it ends up looking like is something like this, where you've got C computer, you've got, let's see. So like a house is just like this. No, it's a single enclosed system. Computers, they can all talk up to the internet and depending on where you are and how it works, they might be connected to each other as well. And also within the computer, there are many, is it unblur? Are we unblurred, Chris? Yeah, awesome. All right, so because of it, it's just a much more complicated system. And then on top of this, there's just the digital complexities of it that a lot of times people don't understand. And outside of computer scientists, it's very difficult to know what is successful and what is not. So as I said, building a wall, you can tell very quickly if it's successful or not. Could you personally tell whether if I were to show you the code for a particular um, piece of security software, would you personally be able to identify whether it's good or not? Nope. No. Now, some of you might be. Some of you might be cybersecurity experts, but you know who's certainly not going to be able to tell whether it's safe or not? Your grandmother. Grandmothers are great, but they're also very bad at technology most of the time. If your grandmother is a technology whiz, great for her. But the vast majority of the time, they aren't going to understand even what is needed for a computer system to run, period, never mind run safely. So because of this, even when there are technical bugs, it's very, it, it's a lot less likely that anyone's going to catch them. And it's a lot more likely that they're going to exist because the nature of the, the coding itself is itself something that is, lend, lends itself to not being perfect because coding by its very nature is never perfect. Um, so everyone understand just like, it's much more technically complex and technically difficult to build a security system that works a computer. Because with this, if the internet has access to your computer, then securing this isn't gonna be enough. You also have to make sure that you are secure from other people. So in a computer system, your security depends on the security of somebody else. If somebody else on the Wi-Fi network is hacked and it's a public Wi-Fi network, you are now at risk, even if you've done everything right. So that's an, so it's just a technically more complex notion. And each step in the way is also more complex. So does everyone understand that? It's like more complex on multiple different levels. It's both the individual computer and any individual piece of software that's needed to keep it secure is much more technically difficult. And also you just need way more of them because the system is so interconnected. Any questions at this point? Are we doing okay? We're good. Okay. Um, and so just like with any other type of security, 
a security system for a computer is only as secure as its weakest link. Because think of it as a house. If a burglar tries to get in, all they need is one unlocked window. In the same way with a computer system, uh, all they need is one unlocked computer or one good access. And as long as these are interconnected, it's going to give them access to the whole network. And to do the sorts of things that you need to do to keep these safe. So um, a lot of companies, what they end up doing is like a good secure system keeps each individual computer just connected to a main thing and kind of compartmentalized from one another. So if I were to hack into this computer, I couldn't get to this one because this one's secure. But to reach that level of sophistication, you need to understand the nature of computer networks. You can't just be like, well, my antivirus is taking care of it. Or, you know, my computer's secure, nobody's in my house. And the average person doesn't understand that level of sophistication. So it's much easier to take advantage of these complex technical issues. All right. Before I go on to point number three, any questions here? Are we doing all right? No, we're good. Okay. We can now talk about dumb people or complex physics. What do people want to talk to talk about first? Uh, complex physics. Yeah. Let's. Let's. Okay. So we will go with um, physical differences. And this kind of ties in with the last thing I said as well. So um, to put it in fancy technical terms, the attack surface of a cyber system is huge. The number of possible attack vectors is huge. So what do I mean by this? So there's the, there's two technical terms that you should uh, recognize or you should learn here. We have attack surface and attack vectors. So what do, what is an attack surface and what are attack vectors? So. First off, what do we mean by a surface, generally speaking? And I can mean this in a sense of like your Surface Pro or the surface of a counter. Wait, sorry, repeat that. What is a surface? And I mean that in the most flat-footed, simple way possible. Oh, um, it's basically like um, like the very top of, or like something that you, it's like, um, Oh, it's like, if you're coming from the outside, you hit that first and then you, you get in afterwards. Yeah, so the surface is just like the outside edges of something. In a physical space, it's stuff you can touch. So like, this is the surface of the board. This is the surface of the table. And what is an attack? Well, it's to aggressively move. So an attack surface is the amount of area that is open to attack. So in the case of a house, it's all the walls that somebody could access it at. So the attack surface is all the potential areas. An attack vector is the route that someone takes to getting into the system. So with a house, it's generally the possible attack vectors are going to be things like what? What are the attack vectors for accessing a house? Physical house. Doors, windows. Doors, windows, that sort of stuff. What are the attack? So those are what we're talking about of attack vectors. And the attack surface of a house is anything that you could attack on the outside. And so what we find is in the physical world, the number of possible attack vectors is very limited by physical space. You cannot access a house on a surface that doesn't exist. You cannot enter through a window that isn't there. With a cyber system, what you find though is that the possible attack surfaces are much, much larger and the directions you can come from are much, much greater. So why is it that the attack surface is so much bigger? Why is it that you have so many more areas to protect with a computer, especially in this modern day and age of internet technology? Well, for what part of the reason is what I said before, computers are complex machines by themselves. So therefore, 
they have, uh, the fact is that any particular point in the system can get attacked. So you've got hardware that could be attacked, software that could be attacked, data entering the system that can be attacked, fake data going in, um, new attacks on things that have not been updated. All this sort of stuff is possible. Now, why, are the, why is the number of possible attack vectors so much bigger? Why is it that the number of ways in which a computer system can be hacked so much greater than a house can be broken into? Uh, because um, we built it and it won't be found unless the company that owns it. So they'll say like that Windows gets attacked. The only person that can fix that is Windows itself, really, because you have to update the Windows software. And then also even with no, um, uh, like any antivirus, they, have, they themselves have to figure out. But the attacks usually come first and then the repairs come later. So there's two issues here that I want to highlight. The one that Marcus just brought up is that because of the physical differences, because you can't see these, the likelihood of there being an attack vector that no one's prepared for is much greater. If you have a physical hole, as I said before, if you've got a physical hole in your wall, you're able to see like, oh crap, something is gonna get through my wall. If your computer system is broken, the likelihood that there's gonna be the likelihood that there's gonna be a successful attack vector is actually quite high because you can't necessarily see. Yari, see you're, you're uh, unmuted. All right, um, the, the attack, the number of potential attack vectors that you might not catch, like, you know, I know if there's a hole in my wall exactly where the squirrels are gonna get in from. No worries, it happens. I've, I've muted when I'm not supposed to, unmuted when I am supposed to, you know. Ever, it happens to everyone, welcome to, internet teaching, no worries at all. So that's one issue is you aren't gonna recognize the potential attack vectors, but there's another issue. What is another reason that the number of attack vectors is bigger? So one is um, can't see the potential attacks. What's the second reason? Why is it that you are just the number of ways you can hack into a system is so much greater than a house. It's always expanding. Right, Pardon? Well, it's like always expanding because like it was originally built on old software, but then those old software aren't, like, it's like same thing building a house where the foundation isn't strong enough. Yeah. And then also there's also new technologies of how the computer handles information and uh, processes stuff. Yeah, so the computers are getting more and more powerful and more and more complicated. And the big issue of this is, as computers get more and more complicated and more and more interconnected, and things like cloud computing become more and more powerful, exactly as Howard says, you can do it from anywhere in the world. You can only physically break into a house from the physical location. But if you are hacked, where are you likely going to be getting hacked from? Well, there's no simple answer to that question. Uh, recent, whenever there's a, like a ransomware attack very often is carried out from somewhere else in the world. So if a company has their, uh, computer system locked and somebody asks for ransom for it, very often they're, they're going to be getting this contact from somewhere in Eastern Europe or somewhere in Southeast Asia, or almost guaranteed not from the United States. So that means that just the number of potential people who can be attacking at any given time is much, much, much greater. And not only that, they can be attacking from anywhere in the world. So you can't actually pinpoint where the attack vector is. With a house, I can say they're going to have to come through this particular space right here in my wall. From here, you can't point to the attack vector because there's literally millions of possible things. It could come from a computer in Australia. It can come from a computer from Russia um, with a signal bounced through Germany to you. It can come from Mexico. It could be your neighbor. It can be anywhere. So because of this, just the number of possible attacks is much greater. So any holes that are there are far, far more likely to be discovered. So that's another major difference between cybersecurity and physical security. The number of people who can break into your house is limited to the number of people who are standing outside of your house. The number of people who can break into your computer is anybody with the computer technical expertise to do so from anywhere in the world. 
So what we end up with is these systems that are incredibly complicated, so complicated that we don't see where these attacks are coming from. And then on top of that, they can come in much greater numbers, much greater abilities, um, or from much farther away in much higher numbers and do large amounts of damage because the likelihood that we have a perfectly secure system is very low because of how complex the system is and because it's not a system that was originally designed for secure with security in mind. So as everyone understand, just like the nature of the internet, what makes the internet great for access and everything else makes the internet the most dangerous way to access a system. Um, or one of the most dangerous things about any sort of computer system, the very same thing that makes it so useful, makes it also very easy to break into. Um, and I want to talk about one last physical difference. And just to go back with my, um, my example of the cockroach from at the start of class, here's a cockroach. Let me draw another cockroach. <laughs> All right, this cockroach, um, how much damage can a cockroach cause when it gets into your house? A lot. A lot. What can it do? Uh, poop a lot, eat a lot, uh, it chew through walls. Um... It can chew through walls, eat a lot, so it can do some damage. But can it really destroy your entire apartment in a day? Not a day, but it'll take time. Yeah, it takes time. It's slow. And why can't it destroy your entire apartment in a day? Uh, you'll okay. probably kill it. Yeah. For one thing, even if like you're on vacation, it's small. As Cynthia said, cockroaches are very small. So the fact that they're small allows them to get in, but also means that once they're in, they can't do all that much damage. And that's why cockroaches are a problem. Now, compare that with, let me draw one. This is not going to be the scale, but... Is that an elephant? Yeah, this is my beautiful elephant. Pretty good. Okay, so here's my elephant. Now, if an elephant got into your house, would it cause a problem? Yeah, it'll yeah. instantly it, destroy it pretty much. It would just by being there for like one second, this elephant would destroy your house. But generally, why aren't we worried about elephants breaking into the house? Because they're not anywhere near. Yeah, they're not anywhere near. And even if there was an elephant outside your door, why wouldn't you be too worried about it? Not very aggressive. It, it, well, they can be very aggressive, but they're not big or they're too big. Like it can't get through the door. Maybe it would try to knock over the house, but it's generally not going to try. Like even an elephant, elephants are actually really smart. Um, random fun fact. Uh, human beings are one of the few animals that if you show them like a human skull, of a human you've never met before, you will still have some sort of emotional reaction. So like if you came upon a dead body, the average human being still freaks out a little bit. It's like, oh my God, that's a human body. Elephants are one of the only other animals that do that. So if they come across like a dead animal, like a dead elephant skeleton, all of them get like really, really quiet and like gently touch the bones and like pay their respects to the dead elephant. Um, so yeah, elephants are super cool, super smart. Another fun fact about elephants is um, one of the tests that they often do in psychology is this mirror test. So very often to tell whether something is aware of itself. Um, so like, you know, you put a bird or a dog in front of a mirror and it barks or squawks or pecks at the mirror because it doesn't realize the thing in the mirror is itself. And so very often uh, the way that we test whether it, uh, an animal has a sense of self that it can identify in a mirror is you put it in front of a mirror and see what it does. And very often what you'll do is like put some paint on it. And if it recognizes that it is itself, that thing in the mirror, it'll try to wipe it off. So um, they've done it. Elephants are also one of the few animals that will recognize themselves. And the adorable thing is very often what will happen with an elephant is if you put in front of a mirror, it will turn around and stick its butt in front of the mirror and look backwards because it's never seen its own butt before. And it's really curious what its own butt looks like. So it's just like get in front of the mirror and be like, oh, I wonder what my butt looks like. I've only ever seen myself from the front and my own trunk. So another fun elephant fact. Um, they check themselves out in the mirror just like we do. Um, all right. So Elephants can cause a lot of damage if they're inside, but generally we don't have to worry about them because the damage, the hole isn't big. 
or the, the holes in our house, our security system isn't big. Cockroaches are small, but because they're small, they get inside and they can't do much damage. And that's just a matter of physical space. But what's the major difference with computer technology? Well, the major difference is the size of the access is in no way cor correlated with how much damage can be done once something's inside the system. So imagine uh, the way to think of a computer virus or a computer insecurity is imagine that cockroaches could enter the house. And then the moment they entered the house, they turned into elephants. And that's really another aspect of cybersecurity. Um, is everyone still there? I just want to make sure that uh, I'm still coming through. Yep. All right, awesome. Okay. So yeah, so that's another issue with it. It's not just that you can access from far away. It's not just that you can't tell when there's a hole in the system. It's rather that a tiny little hole or a tiny little security flaw, one tiny little bug can cause complete chaos in a system. So that's the other issue is computer viruses are like cockroaches that turn into elephants. And those would be a truly terrifying possibility in the real world. Uh, and in the computer world, it's just as much of a terrifying possibility. So it's not just, so we've got the one was the uh, not designed, two technical difficulties, both in terms of the complexity of the system, and in terms of the software programming. Three, we've got the physics, physical, physical differences. And because of this, we've got attack from anywhere, tiny, uh, vulnerability, oh, vulnerability, big damage, don't know when, can't, Am I back? Yes, yeah, perfect. All right, sorry about that. For some reason, um, my internet decided to shut off for a second. So welcome to Insecure Security Systems. So um, awesome. So uh, I don't know where I got cut off. So I want to say the fourth thing to be aware of is what is the weakest link in any security system or any computer system? There's almost always one particular answer. Any guesses? Internet. Not the internet. So the internet is good. That is probably the second most, but even more so than the internet. What, or more accurately, who is the biggest risk? What is the number one thing Yourself. that's like, yeah, a person. People are using computers. And the number one 
biggest security risk of any system is the user themselves. And why is this the case? Why are users such big worries? Well, it's similar to like a house. The number one worry is like forgetting to lock the door. But with a house, it's pretty easy to remember to lock a door. And it's very easy to understand the concept of what it is for a door to lock. What, why is it different with computers? What is it that makes computers and make, specifically makes the user of a computer the number one weakest point? Well, as I said before, who is qualified to identify whether a computer system is secure? Professionals. Professionals. The only people who really can identify whether your system is secure is, a, is somebody who is a professional in it. And not only that, it's, it's not just like in a certain sense, a uh, professional is the only person who can make my door secure, a professional locksmith. But at the very least, I can tell and understand what the locksmith is doing and why what they're doing is so important. Also, I have a general understanding of what it is that an attack on my house might look like. But with computers, very, very few people are even aware of what a computer attack is or how a computer virus would get into the system or the very idea of what could go wrong. So for instance, um, something as simple as the password. Why do computers have passwords? Because they, uh, it allows them to lock a sense of security without much effort, I guess. Yeah, it's designed, ideally, it's supposed to give the user access to the system, but then make sure that the only person that gets access to that system is the user. So it's designed to make a system that is uh, accessible to one person. What is the ultimate flaw of passwords, however? You could guess them. The, say that again? And you can guess them, and then uh, if they're not hashed or anything, you can just read them from like plain text. Yeah, so the main issue with a password is the human mind that it has to be stored in. And the other thing is, it's not the sort of thing that is super secure because if anybody gets that password, it's not like you are told that somebody's in there. Unlike in a physical house, if somebody breaks into your house and is walking around, you're gonna know they were there. You're gonna see things move. Unless you are familiar with your computer system intimately, somebody getting inside is gonna walk around for hours or days or in the most recent hack of the US government, which we'll be talking about a bit later, uh, in the semester, the Russian uh, government was inside there for months collecting data out of the US government's um, servers. And so like, because somebody, if you get that password, it's a big, big problem. And so in this way, people therefore are a weak link because you need to remember what your password is. But every single thing calls for a password. Therefore, you have two options. One, have a different password for everything which you are inevitably gonna forget, or two, have the same password for everything, which means that if one of those systems is insecure, every other system is gonna be insecure as well. And very often people use the same password for companies that are very technologically sophisticated and also things that are very not sophisticated. So for instance, if I have a, a um, password on Amazon, usually that information is stored somewhere but it is not stored with just my password written out. Instead, what it is, is there's a program that Amazon has, which is a one-way encryptor, which turns my password, say my password was one, two, three, it'll turn it into something like this. And if you have this, you can guess this, but if you have this, it doesn't go back the other way. Um, so in that case, it would be very difficult However, your average, you know, little, say you were like, had the same password for your local um, neighborhood watch thing, and it's just run out of somebody's basement. Well, they might store your password in their computer as one, two, three, stored as one, two, three. So if this is hacked and you have the same password everywhere, now every single system you have is going to be vulnerable. And if you're anything like my parents, the very idea of passwords is such a royal pain in the ass because they can never remember them that very often they just use the exact same password for everything with no awareness of the sort of risk that could put them in. My mom uh, has 
all the same passwords for everything, and her identity gets stolen once every three years. Um, and she's tried to do it differently, but she simply cannot remember what's needed there. So that's an issue is um, passwords are very hard to remember. And because of this, another thing, as Marcus said, passwords are very easy to guess. Anyone guess what the most common password is? Each year they come out with a fun list. One, two, three. Uh, it's usually one, two, three, four, five. Also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is common. Any other guesses? Yes, password is a very common password. Um, usually also there's something funny where like whatever pop culture movie has come out this year. Uh, so very often like the year that, oh, your birth date is another very common one or your, especially if it's like a self, like how many of you, when you back had to enter your code to open up your phone, um, your code is your birthday. So that's like another pretty straightforward, easy thing. So if you know a person's birthday, you can generally guess what their password is gonna be. Um, if you try all of these passwords on enough accounts, eventually you're gonna get in somewhere. And once you're in, you have access to all that information. So people are a major weak point in it. Another issue is that because people don't understand, generally people, even when a company says do this or do that, people don't have the technological expertise to do what's needed to make sure the system stays safe or else the sort of technological thing that you have to do is such a pain in the ass that most people don't bother to do it. So very often what ends up happening is um, the other year, does anyone remember, um, what were they called? It was a credit car, it was like a, a credit agency. And so what does a credit agency do? Well, they register everyone's, what credit card numbers you have and how good this person is at paying off their credit card debt. And they are there to make sure that if you apply for a new credit card, the credit card company only gives you that credit card if you deserve it. So um, Equifax. Equifax had a huge hack and millions of credit card numbers were stolen. Why was it that Equifax was able to be hacked? What was it about this that made them so vulnerable? Anybody know? Well, it was actually, what happened was Microsoft discovered there was a bug in their operating system. And this bug allowed somebody to access the network through a back door that was accidentally installed in the, um, in the software or I mean, in the operating system, in the code, if you knew what you were doing, you could get in without the password. So what they did is they went, oh crap, we need to update this. So they very quickly, problem, patch, they patched it. So this was no longer an issue. And what is a patch? It's just new small amounts of software that get added on to something that already exists to fix a problem. It's literally like putting a patch over a balloon. So they patched it. You'd think, all right, well, Microsoft patched it. This wasn't, there was no more problem. Well, what was the issue? Why was Equifax still able to be hacked? Anyone know? Any guesses? The patch caused other problems. It wasn't that the patch caused other problems. What did they not do? Patch. They never installed the patch. They just didn't bother. Why? Because to install a patch on a business computer system means you have to install the patch on every single computer in the office. And for those of you who work in an office, you know that that and there's any familiarity with computers, that can be a lot of computers and it can really knock things offline for like a whole week. So a company that's trying to turn a profit and trying to get things done as quickly as possible is just going to say something like, well, you know what? We'll put off the patching, we'll put off the patching, we'll put off the patching. I mean, raise your hand if you've not updated your phone because you didn't feel like dealing with the fact that it said, oh, fuck, I got to sit here for like 20 hours, plug it in, and or I got to sit, plug it in for 20 minutes and wait for it to download and then upload, and I've got better things to do. How many of us are guilty of this? I do it on my computer sometimes. Yeah, we've all done it. Why? Because it's a pain in the ass, and bec but because it, it's a pain in the ass, we don't do it, and every time we don't do it, it can very often mean that we end up leaving security issues. And this goes back to Marcus's point from earlier, which is even if there is a patch and even if it may, is connected to a major security flaw, the company that releases this patch is generally not going to stress to you whether or not that patch is actually tied to a major security flaw. 
So if it is a security flaw, they're not gonna jump around and be like, hey, hey, we're Microsoft. You just paid us $99 for a new operating system and it's got a giant security flaw in it. That's why you should download this patch because we screwed up. They're not gonna say that. They're instead just gonna include something like fixes occasional bugs and improves performance. So if you see fixes occasional bugs and improves performance, you're not gonna download the patch. You're just gonna be like, I'll deal with this another time. If however, you were to recognize that there was a giant security flaw in it, you might download it faster, but you'd also think, can I really trust Microsoft going forward? So there's this major issue here of even if there are technical solutions, not everyone, humans are lazy. And so humans are very willing to um, put themselves at risk because they don't quite understand what the risks are or how it works. So does everyone understand that additional worry here? Any other, are we all still here? Have I lost my internet again? No, you're good. Yeah, awesome. All right, so the last thing about people is, this is actually the most common way. So what I wanna talk about now is the best way to keep yourself safe as a computer user is to know what the dangers are and to protect against them. So these other ones, the technical expertise, you can get that knowledge, but it takes a lot. And even if you do have it, there's still gonna be bugs. But the majority of issues with <clears throat> computers are things that most of the time there's a hack. It's because somebody screwed up. And one of the best ways to make sure you don't screw up is to know what the possible screws up are, screw ups are. So um, social, I can never remember what the term is. So I'm just kind of getting blurry. Oh, thank you. Social engineering. Most cyber attacks are social engineering attacks. What is social engineering? Thank you, those of you who said engineering. Impers um, impersonating something. Like, it's like, oh, if you work at a company, somebody, the hacker would try to impersonate somebody that works at the company and then try to get in. Basically what it is, is you put someone else in a situation. You don't hack in in like the cool computer hacker in the movies sort of way. It's like, shh, shh, now I'm in. What you do is you convince someone else to give you that information willingly, usually by pretending to be somebody you aren't. So the most classic, hilarious case of social engineering is the Nigerian Prince scheme. How many people are familiar with the Nigerian Prince scheme? It was popular, Jorge, was that a yes? Well, I've heard about this, where yeah. they mm -hmm, tried to, um impersonate a, a prince that wants to give you um like a lot of money and you yeah. have to give them your information first yeah so it's basically you get an email from someone and it's like dear so-and-so my name is something and i am a prince of nigeria i've been kicked out of my my country for social disobedience and i'm looking to get back in however to pay for my passport i have or i have a lot of supporters back in the country but to pay for my passport i need a uh, certain amount of money. I know, I've heard from my contacts that you are someone who cares about social justice and political, uh, the spread of democracy and that you would be a willing participant. Therefore, please wire me this amount of money. If you do that, I promise that once I'm back in power, I will give you 10 times as much money as you gave me. Please pass it along. Like, please, will you do this? Please contact me. Um, obviously, the person who's contacting you is not a Nigerian prince. The person who's contacting you is a scammer. But why does this sort of thing work? Well, it's what's called a phishing email. Now, with phishing, what's the key to a good phishing email? What is it that makes a phishing approach successful? Uh, people are um, not really like paying attention to who the sender and like where where it's going or sending it back to. Yeah, and also the main thing you want to do is you want to, if you are sending it, it has to be believable, but also how many people does it need to work on for you to have success? One person. One, one person. All you need to get rich is have one person. And how much effort is it to email a million people? It's one click. Yeah, it's one click. So phishing, the approach to phishing is you just send out a mass email. So I'm sure some of you got one this semester of like, dear John, dear CUNY community, there's a phishing scam going on. Do not give them your social security number. 
It's coming from this email address. And the reason we all got that, um, I'm actually not sure which schools it got it and which schools did it, but I know some of them did. And the reason why they send it to everyone is because the phishing approach is to send it out to every single person. So that's the first thing is phishing as you send it. Now, are people familiar with the term spear phishing? Has anyone heard the term spear phishing in a computer context? Nope. Okay, so if you're regular, I guess it should be spear phishing. So let's go with the metaphor. When you're regular phishing, like a commercial phishing co company, what do they use to catch fish? Usually Hooks big and bait. nets. Sometimes they'll use bait, but more often it's nets. And the approach with a net is you throw it and eventually you're gonna get some fish, but you're not targeting any particular fish. Now, if you're spear fishing, you're fishing with a spear gun. Do people know what those are? It's basically, yes, yep. yeah. It's like a little hydraulic weapon that attached to it is a spear. And when you're spear fishing, there's a particular fish you're aiming for. So you find that particular fish, you track onto it and you shoot it. In the same way with a spear fishing scam. What spear phishing is, is a way of, instead of just sending a general phishing email, you identify a particular person you want to get the information from. And in that email, you give them information that makes it more and more believable. So very often, it'll be something like an email address that looks like an email address you know. So for instance, I got an email from an email address that was designed to look like my department chair, and even had a picture of him in the Gmail, only instead of like john.doe at jj, it was john.doe.jj at Gmail. So it was designed to look like an email that would be believable. Also, like the best spear phishing will include things like saying, hey, this is your boss. Will you please, uh, I know it's your first day and I need you to buy this so we can buy this other thing. So very often companies will do that. Like somebody will be like, oh, I have a fake email of the boss. I will tell this new employee and I know they're a new employee because I looked on their LinkedIn page. And therefore I know that they are going to be susceptible to an attack if I pretend to be their new boss. So that's what spear phishing is, is you approach someone pretending to be someone else. So just because you're getting an email that looks like it could be something you want to respond to, you have to be very, very careful not to respond to it. Now, very often phishing and spear phishing will be also connected to things like um, viruses and Trojans. So what is a virus and what is a Trojan in a computer setting? A virus is a computer uh, bug that will replicate itself just like an actual virus. So if you click on a link, it might install a virus on your computer, which will then collect information or install something or scan your computer for certain sorts of data. And Trojans are actual programs that you actually have to like, execute. So it'll be, it'll look like a regular .exe file um, on a Windows and it'll be like, hey, do you want to download this thing? If you click yes, it will then install something into your computer. So very often a phishing email or a spear phishing email will include an attachment that is a program and it'll look like something perfectly innocuous, but in the background, it will install something onto your computer. So whenever you're getting, what's the quickest way of keeping yourself safe from these? Well, you got to read your email very closely and you got to make sure that what you're giving them is the sort of thing like whenever you're asked for new information, pause for a second and make sure it makes sense. Because the fact is we get hit with so much information that it can be very hard to remind yourself like, hey, I need to pause and ask myself, is this something that somebody like this would actually send me? What are the potential risks? What information are they accessing, et cetera? What are some other sorts of attack types that you have heard of or are familiar with? Anybody have any that they want to include? How many of you have heard of a man in the middle attack? I have. 
Okay, so what is a man in the middle attack? This is a newer type of attack that you should just be aware of existing. Uh, basically, um, it impersonates somebody that um, well, for me at least, um, there's a thing with like CS:GO, um, like trading, where basically like there's uh some you have a trader who verifies like the um like the the item and that the, the transaction that's being done, but then they 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 um the person that was like they impersonate somebody that is supposed to be that, so like uh they actually get what they want from you, like because you think that it's like oh it's secure and stuff, but somebody else actually is doing the thing. So think of it this way. Let's say, this is, um, this is the, say it's the server uh, in which you have your bank info stored, bank. And so what you're doing is you're accessing this bank. So what's going this direction is very confidential information. Um, and what comes back is also confidential information. So one way you could get this information if you were a uh, somebody who wanted it is one, you could hack into the bank account servers. That's very difficult. Banks have very good security systems. You could also steal someone's computer and get in that way. Again, very difficult to physically do that. So where's the third place you could obviously try to get this information? The middle. In the middle, instead of trying to get it at either end, you intercept it in the middle. And so basically what this is, is a computer system will, uh, somebody will insert themselves in the middle. And what they basically do is they hijack this connection. So instead of going directly to the bank, it will go to this computer in the middle. This computer then accesses all the information that's coming through it uh, that is unencrypted looks at it and then decides what it sends on to the bank. And then if the bank is also, then any information from the bank will go here and then get it sent onwards. So a person monitoring this could read your password, save it for later, let the request go through, then wait for the bank to send it back, take it at that moment and redirect the money into a different account. So that's what a man in the middle attack is. And the way man in the middle attacks generally happen these days is it's very difficult to uh, get access to a computer that is on a totally different network than yours. But if you're on the same Wi-Fi network as something else, generally, if you know what you're doing, it's rather easy to intercept information on that network. So if you are in a Starbucks back in the day when we actually left our apartments, um, if you're at a Starbucks and you log on to their public Wi-Fi network and there's somebody else physically in the Starbucks also on that network who knows what they're doing, they have the ability to monitor all the information leaving your computer because they could insert themselves as a man in the middle. So another thing to do is always be aware of what Wi-Fi networks you're on. And if you're on a public Wi-Fi network, don't do something that puts you at risk. Do not log into your bank from a public Wi-Fi network. Do not log into anything with the same password you use for everything else through a Wi-Fi network. Another thing that Anthony uh, just brought up, re redirects a request to a fake site. So yeah, very often the way it'll be set up is they will ha have designed a web page that looks a lot like another web page. So for instance, I had a student um, who took this class, I guess it was about five semesters back, who was like, legitimately an excellent computer hacker. He did a lot of work for companies um, to try to do some white hat hacking for them. But on the side, he liked to experiment. And he discovered that he could make a page that looked a lot like the Google homepage, but instead of when your Google search went through going to um, actual Google, it would just look like it refreshed the page and whatever you typed in, would be redirected to a server he had and just collect whatever, whatever information you typed in. So in a case like this, Google, not that big of a deal. But if you make a fake Gmail account page, then if you type in your Gmail information, he now has your username and password. And so that's the sort of thing that's becoming more and more common is make sure that if anything is not running like it's supposed to, don't just repeatedly enter your information. Also, if at any point you have any fear that a password has been compromised, change your password. Um, 
make sure to do that. Also, those password secure storage device things, I can never remember what they're called. Those are a good things. So you can have different passwords everywhere. And then just your one particular password unlocker, which will give you more control over the system. Again, not perfect because if you get that password, you're still screwed. But um, this is the degree of security or the types of security worries you have to have when you're dealing with a computer. Um, Another thing to be aware of, just a term you should know, is a what is a zero day exploit? Anybody know? Oh, so basically, zero day exploits are like, oh, um, uh, like, so say, like, the Windows patches something, like, the day it's patched, the zero day exploits are like, um, what people try to attack the most because they haven't patched it yet. So um... a zero day exploit is a flaw in a software program or system that the designer doesn't know is there yet. So these are the most coveted type of uh, these are the most coveted type of um, vulnerability in a system. So any uh, attack if an attack vector goes through a zero day exploit, these are the things that sell on the dark web for like $10 million plus a pop. Because if somebody doesn't even know it's there, they have not protected against it. As soon as a bug is recognized, a company will start working to patch it. So anytime a new software comes out or a new operating system comes out, there's almost always gonna be some bugs in it that are security flaw. As soon as that's recognized by hackers, and they decide to imp implement it, the company will start patching. But before it's patched, it's called a zero day exploit. And because of the, these zero day exploits, these are things that really are there and there's nothing you can do to stop them. They are there, you could be exploited by them. But because of this, um, the only thing you can do is just be smart about what information is kept on your computer and what information is kept secure. Because here's another thing, is the most successful hacking groups in the world right now, anyone have a guess of what their names are? You've heard of all of them. Anonymous. So Anonymous is down a ways. Anonymous. And Anonymous is a hacker collective that works towards like hacktivism and working towards uh, the freedom of information. They have very libertarian views, so they will hack to try to release information that they think should be out there. But Anonymous is really small potatoes in comparison to these other large things. Anyone know what the uh, three most powerful hacker organizations in the world are? I'll give you a clue. Um, here, I'll put up some... some uh, Okay, no, let's, let's go Hangman. Guess our letters. Professor, I, I don't know the name, but I know that some governments are behind them. There we go. You, you said it spot on. It's the USA, China, Russia. These are probably the largest, and within them, they have sub-branches. Also on this list would be places like North Korea, um, any the Ukraine. These are countries with huge amounts of hacking capabilities. Nobody has the ability to hack like a government does because it has so much funding and can afford to train people in these areas. Now, because of this, if a government wanted to hack into your system, they could. In fact, these countries are constantly hacking each other. And when they do it, they do it with the big guns. So for instance, um, a sing as I said, a single zero day exploit can sell for like 10, $20 million on the dark web. When the US government hacked into the Iranian government, and we'll talk about this more later in the semester, um, they use something like four or five zero day exploits in the same hack. That if you're willing to give away $50 million of hacks in a single hack, you're a government. So with this sort of firepower, you don't stand a chance if somebody wants to get in. So the best way to keep yourself safe is to minimize what is on your computer and what is available and to make sure that you just do everything you can to stay as safe as possible. It is not hopeless because the difference between a little hack 
and being completely hacked is big. So everything you can do, I mean, you cannot compete with the United States, China, and Russia for resources and hacking capability or protection. If they want to get in, they will. But you can make it so that one, there's nothing interesting that they want to hack. And two, uh, it's not make it as difficult as possible such that if you had something that was mildly interesting, it wouldn't be worth the effort for them. So these are the, the sorts of countries that are dealing with hacking. We'll come back to these later in the semester. But because there's such re uh, reward for hacking, uh, many, many countries and governments and everything else will do it, which takes me actually into a uh, fifth thing I want to say about uh, why cybersecurity is so bad. And this is going to be a, a theme we come back to all semester. But first off, any questions right now? Are we doing all right? Let me just take one sip of water. Yeah, we're good. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Professor, I just wanted to mention, I just recently heard about the US hacking into, I, I think it was the German government with machines, with encrypting machines that they could, they were able to read. I, I don't remember exactly. I think it was- I'll last have to month. look it up. Um, how recently was this? I think it was last semester. Last okay. semester. I'll look into it because the fact is last semester I uh, was in the throes of COVID and lost sight of what hacks were going on. The main one that I paid attention to was the, uh, the hack of the US government by the Russian government and various other giant corporations, which we will be talking about more. But um, I'll look that one up for the next time we're talking more directly about hacking, because we'll come back to hacking in the cybercrime week. Um, talk a lot more about what sorts of hacks happen and how they happen and the line between a crime and war and all these other things. Um, but I'll make sure to bring that one up. The last thing I want to bring up is, uh, what is the exact wording that the book uses? Or not the book, the reading. It calls legal and policy frameworks. Here's another thing to keep in mind, and this really ties in with the last thing of humans being the weakest points and it being so complicated that no one really understands it. Well, when a computer system is hacked, who wants to take credit and say, we screwed up, it's our fault that your computer system was hacked? Nobody. Nobody wants to. So very often what happens is nobody owns up to it. So because of this, it's not just that uh, nobody owns up to it. Therefore, we often don't find out that we're at risk until months after it happens. So that's one reason that security risks are so high is it's very, very likely that if you're hacked, you're not even gonna know it. Like the majority of us have been hacked and only some of us know we've been hacked. Um, another issue with it is if you fail to lock your door and somebody breaks into your house, um, whose fault is it that the door didn't get locked? The person itself, like, who didn't lock the door? Yeah, you forgot to lock the door. It's your fault in some sense. I mean, granted, you'd still, like, it would also be the criminal's fault. But if you went to the uh, locksmith and were like, you put on a bad lock, you didn't make it so the door stayed, sh stayed shut. And the locksmith was like, did you lock the door? And you're like, no, 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 I didn't lock the door, but that's besides the point. Your lock didn't work. They're going to be like, you have the responsibility to lock the door. And if you sue that locksmith because you forgot to lock the door, then like, they're, you're not going to make any money. They're just going to be like, you're an idiot who didn't lock your door. But what do you do in the case of a computer system? Are you responsible for making sure that your firewall is up to date? Well, if we go by analogy with a house, yes, you are. But it's so complicated and so uh, so many different levels in the uh, degree of making sure your system's secure. Is it really appropriate? Like if your grandma gets hacked because she didn't understand how to update her computer properly, can we really say, well, grandma should have locked the computer better. It's her damn fault. She deserved to have her, her things taken. It just feels somewhat different. Also, there's a major issue with computers having to do with the intersection between public and private. Also between um, 
punishment versus reward. So the first thing I want to say, let's do the punishment versus reward case. When you are hacking into a computer system or when somebody is violating computer security, the potential reward is massive. And this is massive for the exact same reason we talked about before. The world is so interconnected that if you manage to hack into one giant company through one particular bug, you can make huge, 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 huge amounts of money. So if I hack into one house, or, or by hack, I mean break into one house, the most I'm going to get is whatever's in that house. And nobody keeps $100 million in their house. But if I break into, say, Amazon, and I manage to get credit card information off of Amazon, that is millions of dollars in one hack. So that's one reason. So the, the reward people have is much higher. So they're far more likely to try to break into a computer system. And on the flip side, what is the main, what are the major reasons we don't try to break into houses? Punishment is also massive. Yeah, you can get in huge yeah, no trouble if you too. break into, you can break into a, like huge trouble if you break into a house. However, uh, and why, how hard is it to punish you when you break into a house? Pretty well, easy. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, you're within the physical location. If you break into the house, you probably didn't go very far. If, however, you're hacking from a halfway around the world, if a Russian hacker breaks into it, or let's go with a better example. If a North Korean company or a North Korean hacker group hacks into a... Um, I don't know, let's go with uh, Barnes and Noble. If a North Korean hacker group hacked into Barnes and Noble, uh, what would the North, Cor who would punish them? What would happen? Uh, nothing really, because uh, it's because there's immunity, because otherwise we will start a war. Yeah, so basically, so one thing Cynthia says is it's much easier to identify the culprit. So that's true as well. So one thing is if somebody hacks into a system, it's very difficult because they could be anywhere in the world to even know who it was. If you break into a house physically, you're going to leave. There's a chance you'll be caught on the premises. It's much easier to guess who it is based on video and everything else. A hack from halfway around the world, nothing. Also, if you get caught, even if they figure out who did it, the odds are that they're doing it from a country with no, uh, that the US has no jurisdiction over. So if a hacker hacks from Russia or North Korea, the only thing we can do is say, hey, North Korean government, will you send that criminal back to us? And the North Korean government is gonna hold up two middle fingers and say, screw you, we're not giving you anything. And so for this, in this way, even if we know who hacked, the odds are they're not gonna get punished for it. And there's no, overarching international law governing hacking crimes for it. No, I was going to say, because um, oftentimes, uh, as you mentioned, that government is behind the hacking. And that's another issue is very often it'll be the government themselves doing the hacking. So the North Korean government isn't going to be like, yep, you caught us. Here, we'll pay a fine. They're just going to be like, wasn't us. They're going to be like, I have proof it was you. And they'll be like, well, you can think that, but we're going to deny it until the day we die and you're not going to stop us. So there's really no way of punishing. And the other issue, which we're gonna come back to later with the uh, hacking of the US government is we're not really sure how on earth we're supposed to respond if a country hacks into another country. Like if North Korean soldiers landed on the Western coast of the United States, who would be called? What was the question, Professor? I'm the sorry. question is, if U.S. or Chinese soldiers landed on the West Coast of the United States, who gets called? The government. The government, specifically the army. Why? Because that's an act of war. If a U.S. soldier shoots, like, if a, or if a Chinese soldier came to America and broke a computer with a rifle butt, or if an American soldier went to China and broke a computer with a rifle butt, it would be an act of physical war. But if a company, a Chinese hacker collective breaks into a U.S. government records or a U.S. government hacker collective breaks into Chinese records, it's not an act of war, even if they do the same damage that would have been done by a physical person. So we have this idea also of like, we don't even know what to call these things. We want to call it cyber war, but really cyber war isn't quite the same as war because there's no boots on the ground or guns being fired. But it's also not quite the same as just like 
minimal spying because you can do major damage in these sorts of cases. Now, the last thing I want to talk about on this front is private versus public. So what do I mean by this? Well, as more and more uh, companies get bigger and bigger and have access over government records or interact with government resources, it becomes very clear who should take responsibility for the security system. So for instance, um, the other year, I think it was the Department of Defense, basically the Pentagon signed like a $10 billion contract with Microsoft to run the Pentagon's computer system off of uh, Microsoft web services. So basically the cloud that the US government was gonna be using was going to be provided to them by Microsoft and run off of Microsoft servers. Now, so you've got this intertwining of public and private. If somebody breaks into the Pentagon physically, it was the Pentagon's fault that they were broken into and the government has to respond. If Amazon headquarters or Microsoft headquarters is broken into, it's Amazon or Microsoft's job to deal with it. But what happens if it's US government uh, computer systems running off of Microsoft web services? So you've got government data and government software, but it is on top of Microsoft, Microsoft physical servers. So what is the problem here? What is the worry about having the government data being stored on Microsoft physical servers? Well, who is responsible for keeping it secure? And going back to what I talked to earlier in the class, why is it, is it gonna be cheap to keep this information secure? Is it easy to keep computer information secure and safe and private? Nope. No, it's very expensive. So Microsoft is going to say who should pay for it? Government. The government. And who's the government saying should pay for it? Them. Microsoft should. So you have these things in which what ends up happening is Microsoft says, we provided the service. We're not, responsibility for, we're not responsible for the security. The government says, we paid and hired you as a company. You owe us top-notch security. And so in this particular case, it will often happen, like I'm sure that this particular deal, they worked out who was culpable and who was responsible for what. But in many cases, what ends up happening is nobody wants to take responsibility and nobody puts the money in because they assume somebody else is going to be responsible for it. So if like um, a power plant is running uh, a computer system, but it's a public service, they're going to say, we as this private company, you government, oh, we need money to keep our computer systems secure. Therefore, you should give us some money. And the government's going to say, no, 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 no. You're a private company who's making money, making power. You should be responsible for this. And what ends up happening is what? Well, nobody ends up installing the levels of security on systems that need to be there to keep things safe because it's not clear who should be responsible for it. And because it's expensive, nobody bothers to do it at all until something goes wrong. And so this is often what happens in cases of hacks is multiple different groups all refuse to take responsibility for it because they assume it's somebody else's fault. And there's no law in place that says whose fault it should be. So does everyone understand this last issue with security? The issue is nobody wants to put the money in to make things secure. It's not there by default because of what I said about the nature of computers. And because we don't have any legal policy framework, if you get hacked, very often, nobody really gets too much blame. Um, people will get mad, but eventually, you know, when Target got hacked and 100 million people's information was stolen, that didn't mean it Target took a bump for a little bit, but it hasn't like devastated Target in the long run. Target's doing just fine. So what ends up happening is the people at the lower end end up getting screwed. The people who have uh, their credit card information in Target, they get screwed. The people who, um, you know, those of us who are on the John Jay email server get screwed. Those of us who are U.S. citizens and have our information taken get screwed. The government organizations, they end up being fine. So that's the final reason that cybersecurity is so damn hard. 
All right, are there any more questions on this stuff? Anything about why cybersecurity is hard? Why people are always the weakest point? Why any of this stuff is the case? No. Okay. Um, yeah, Professor, what? just one last thing I, yeah, I want to mention. Um, all these legal um, policy frameworks, because is, that is really like a lacking um, thing, these big companies, they care about performance and they don't have security as like a paramount thing, you know? Because you nobody's really like having that legal framework for you. And thank you. I should have brought this up already. Thank you so much for doing so, Jorge. And here's the last reason that um, cybersecurity is so hard and why there are always mistakes is there's not that much financial incentive for making your system perfectly secure. Rather, there's incentive to make the thing flashy and appealing to consumers. So the average cons consumer looks at an Apple Watch and thinks, wow, that Apple Watch is going to give me an ability to call my friends even when my phone's dead, to ha have my um, number of steps tracked, to easily measure my heart rate throughout the day. The average consumer isn't going to think but what are the security risks on my Apple Watch? Is this gonna give someone access to my home Wi-Fi? Is this gonna give someone access to my credit card information? So therefore what companies will do is if you've only got 1 million to spend on your uh, say new product, here can be our electric tea kettle, which is a thing. They're now smart tea kettles that you can turn on your tea kettle from your bed. Um, if you have only a million to spend on research and development, what are you going to spend it on if your job is to sell tea kettles? Are you going to make sure that this tea kettle has the best security system ever? Or are you going to make sure it brews goddamn good tea? What are you going to spend your money on as a company? What's going to get you more profit? Uh, making sure that it does, um, that it performs well, I guess. Yeah, what's going to make sure. Mm. What's going to make you profit is to make sure this is the best tea kettle out there, so that people buy the tea kettle. If afterwards it turns out there's a security flaw, well, so what? You already made your money. If, however, you end up making half as good of a tea kettle because half of your budget goes into security, you aren't going to make as much money. So what companies do, they're incentivized to take a big risk and pour everything into research and development and not put anything into security. So one of the most, um, one of the riskiest areas in any network are the new smart devices that are coming out. So any sort of thing that is a, like a specialty device that has a, an app or security system hooked up to it, um, these are the sorts of things that are very open to risk. So um, I'm not going to share it because it's not, uh, it's not suitable for work, but there was a case I read about recently in which somebody hacked into a uh, sex toy and basically demanded ransom in exchange to give this person control of their own sex toy back. And why was it the case? Well, it's because this smart sex toy was not hooked up to be secure. It was hooked up to be used in sex. Therefore, it was a major security issue. Um, and these are the sorts of things that also happen with, uh, and this is why, why ransomware attacks are so common. So what is a ransomware attack? Just one last type of attack to highlight. It's basically like, oh, you, you take uh, somebody puts like a uh, software. So say like you click a link and then it'll download the software and then it'll start encrypting all your files and then asking for, oh, it'll be like, oh, um, you have this X amount of days to pay this amount of money. And if you don't pay it, then either you'll delete the files or you'll never get your computer back. Exactly. Jorge, did you want to add? Professor, it, 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 it's tied with availability, right? They, you're not able to get to your files until you um, do what they ask, they're they asking exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah, it's the availability accessibility one. So yeah, basically what it is, if you, somebody sends you an email or sends you something, you download a program which encrypts all your files, which means you cannot access your files. So you've lost all the availability to your data. And then what they say is you pay us X amount of money or else we are going to not give you access to your files back and maybe even sell them on the internet. So recently um, a, video, a major video game company was had their uh, information stolen and uh, cyber, it was encrypted. They had backup files, so they kept it. But basically this, this group said, you either pay us some 
a few million dollars or else we are going to sell this data on the internet and you are not going to be able to, you're going to have to use your backup files and the company didn't pay. And supposedly the files that were stolen were sold for anywhere between eight and $10 million on the dark web. So these are the sorts of things that uh, ransomware attacks are. And one of the reasons that ransomware attacks are so, so common is that they are targeted at companies whose software is not designed to be secure because nobody thought that anyone was going to be attacking. So what, anyone know what the most common type of company to get ransomware is? Anybody? What, like as in like a target or? Yeah, type of target, like the type of oh, business. Oh, Google, like big, very large corporations. So large oh. corporations, but very often large corporations have very good security systems. Um, so they're not always the main target. Oh, Professor, I guess what you just mentioned also, the, um, those companies that come up with video games, they're not really thinking about security. Too exactly. Much. So they, they target companies that have a lot of powerful data, that a lot of valuable data, and are very not considering security as the major thing. So what sort of business or organization has data that is very, very, very important, needs access to that data and all the computer systems? And also, the last thing they're thinking about most of the time is cybersecurity. Any takers? No, it's not a church, it's a hospital. Hospitals are one of the major targets. Hospitals and doctor's offices are one of the major, major targets for ransomware attacks because a hospital cannot run without a computer system. So there have been many issues of literally somebody's in the middle of surgery and suddenly computer system goes out and the doctor no longer has access to the things. And because of this, hospitals are very likely to pay the ransom because they cannot afford to have their computer systems down. So, but also, um, yeah, insurance companies as well. Um, and because of this, and be, hospitals also, what is the hospital's computer system's number one concern? Well, the health of its patients. So hospitals were not thinking of themselves as risks uh, as, or hospitals and doctor offices were not thinking of themselves as at risk for security breaches, and yet here they were because of the nature of it. So what we're finding also is as technology shifts and we become more dependent on computers, the number of ways in which a computer system can be attacked and what can be done to it is changing as well. And because of the nature of this also, one of the reasons these hospitals were so vulnerable is they were using software for to store patient information and things like that and insurance information. And those software programs were designed to be efficient and simple and cheap so the hospitals could afford them. They didn't have great security systems and the companies that built them didn't put in the security systems because there was no financial incentive to do so. So this is just, there's this giant vacuum in security created by the nature of the way uh, money is made through cyber technology. All right, any last questions on this? Thank you so much for bringing up that point, Jorge. That was a really good thing for me to uh, mention here. Okay. All right. The last thing I wanna bring up is just, we'll spend 10 minutes just defining this term so we're all on the same page. What is the definition of hacking? There's a, there's a technical definition. What is it to hack into a system? Wait, sorry, wait, what, what's the question? What is hacking? What is the oh, definition basi of hacking? Uh, basically getting into somebody's system and stealing information or so any other person not that. Even, um, it's not, so you're both along the right. It's, there's an element of getting into the system and stealing information or, and very often that's exploitation of data. But by definition, all hacking is, is being in a system without permission to be there. So being in system without permission, without express, 
permission. So because of this technical def definition, it's basically just the definition of hacking is more or less just trespassing in somebody's cyber network or cyber account. So it's hacking if you type in a password that you happen to know to get in there and they didn't give you permission. If you exploit a bug in the system to get in, that's also hacking. If you um, punch someone in the face, knock them out and then type on their computer, that is hacking. If they leave the computer system on and you just walk over to it and go into it, that's also hacking. Um, if you're trying with the company's permission to find access to it, without them giving you express permission into this particular part, that is also hacking. So with this definition, is hacking by definition a bad thing? Yes. I agree. So very often, so Cynthia is correct, maybe. Maybe it is, and it's a case by case basis. And I wanted to bring this up just because these are terms that you will hear. White, black, gray, hat, hacking. So all hacking is, is by definition, getting into a computer, a part of a computer without being given explicit uh, permission to be there. Now, because of this, whether or not hacking is going to be legal or sorry, whether or not hacking is going to be moral is going to come down to what you're doing and why you're hacking in. So the classic case of hacking that we think of is what is called black hat hacking. So in a like fantasy book or the Wizard of Oz or something like that, who wears black? Bad guys. Bad guys. The bad guy wears the black. So in the same way, a black hat, black hat hacker is a bad guy. They are somebody who is trying to hack into a system for their own personal gain. So these types of hackers are always bad. These are people who are stealing things from other people and black hat hacking is always a crime. Now, in the fantasy book in uh, Wizard of Oz, who wears white? The good guys. The good guys generally wear white. So white hat hacking is good hacking. So does anyone know what white hat hacking actually consists of? What type of hacking would be considered good or morally good hacking? Ethical hacking. So what, what would be an example of ethical hacking, Yaris? I don't know, a person that works for the police department and needs to get into a criminal something to get the information. Like so yeah, so very often it's cases in which someone, so this is actually um, the police I'm gonna put uh, over here because police is either going to be white or it's going to be gray uh, because very often the hacking the police does, uh, it depends on who the criminal is and what they're doing. So it can even be a little bit into the not entirely white area because some people think a police officer hacking into a criminal's um, bank account to fro freeze their funds, even if that person is a criminal, violates certain Fourth Amendment rights and other things like that. So that is, I think some cases of police are gonna clearly be white hat hacking. But what is the, um, anyone know the classic case of white hat hacking? Who are you hired by? The company you itself. Be, yeah, you're hired by the company itself. And very often you're basically hired as quality control. So a company like Microsoft, hires, has a bunch of in-house hackers and will also hire large numbers of freelancers. And the situation will be something like this. Um, we will pay you a yearly salary and your job is to try to get into our computer system. Your job is to try to get in here. Why would they pay a company to do this or a, a person to do this? So they can see the weaknesses that they have in the system? Exactly. Yeah. You test it out. And the best way to find if there's a weakness is have somebody look for it. If they find one, then you can fix it before it ever makes it out onto market. So that's classic white hat hacking. And if you go into white hat hacking, you can make a damn good career of it. It's very good money. You have to be a very skilled hacker to do it. And if you're somebody who really likes puzzle solving, it can be a very enjoyable career. Um, and also very often you get into it through freelancing and the way a company will do it is something like, all right, if you find a bug, we'll give you $20,000. If you don't, you get nothing. 
Um, so that's a classic case of just incentivizing people to search. Black hat hacking is you don't do it for the company's benefit. It's entirely for yourself. Jorge. Oh, no, I was just going to mention that uh, that white um, hat hacking, sometimes it's, uh, they're called penetration tests. Yes. That's a, thank you for bringing up that term. So yeah, penetration test. So in a certain sense, it still counts as hacking because if you penetrate the system in that way, it's not going to, you're not going to be in that part of the system with the company's permission. They gave you permission to try, but they didn't give you permission to succeed. So it still counts as hacking. Well, in the black hat case, it's literally getting in there to take things. Now, if the good guys are white and the black, the bad guys are black, what what are the gray guys? It'll be like a roving hook kind of thing. That yeah. you're it's it's somewhere in between. It's like Robin Hood or something else. You could go both ways. So very often what it is is it's cases in which it's not clearly morally okay. But it's also generally done for a cause that seems more uh, respectable. So, for instance, there are cases we can go back to. Um, was it Marcus before who brought up Anonymous? Yeah. Okay. So, Anonymous is a hacker organization that is kind of a loose connection of people who believe in the freedom of information and believe that um, people should be punished even if. Uh, there, if no government can punish a people, therefore somebody else needs to step in and they will use their computer abilities. However, very often their views are very ideological and are things that not everyone would agree with. And sometimes things go terribly wrong, even if you agree with their intentions. So for instance, there was one case in which um, there was a coup in somewhere, I want to say it was Libya. It was a a democratic government was overthrown and Anonymous decided this is unacceptable. So what Anonymous did was they carried out a DDoS attack on this government's website and everything else. So what is a DDoS attack or DDoS? That's not an S. Uh, distributed denial of service. Yeah. And so how does it work? Well, basically, at the end of the day, all computers and all systems ultimately run on fiber optic cables. And fiber optic cables hook up to processing systems. So everything internet cloud, at the end of the day, there's something physical there underneath it. And like everything physical, it has limits. So um, what's the best way to, how many of you have tried to turn on too many appliances in your house at once? You've got the, you've got like 37 lamps turned on for some reason. Uh, I've, Turn off the, or t try to boil water while turning on the microwave, and then yeah, it blows, yeah. blows the thing. Yeah, it blows the fuse. It's just there's too much going on, and the circuit breaker kicks, and all the lights go out. Well, in the same way with a computer system, if you give it too much information to process, it'll just shut off. It'll just, <clears throat> and that's what a DDoS attack is. You just get a large number of computers to all try to access the same thing at once and shut it down. So very often a company or a hacker collective will try to shut down a government whose policies it doesn't agree with, or also anonymous. Um, there was a case after a credit card company did something that they thought was sketchy. So they carried out a DDoS attack and shut down this credit card company's website for several hours, which meant that nobody could use that credit card for that many hours and it cost the company millions of dollars. So these, these are the sorts of things. So on the one hand, you might say like, oh, this is for a noble cause. I agree that this company needs to be put in its place, but the way it's carried out is illegal and is going to cause harm to a lot of ordinary people as well. Other cases of this sort of thing, um, we can talk about, I think some cases with the police are very clearly white hat in which you're just like testing to make sure that somebody's um, not getting access to a certain computer system and that sort of thing. But sometimes what a... Uh, police officer will do is do something kind of in between. So you can, um, if you gain access to a criminal's computer by impersonating somebody else. So if you say, so a classic case of this is if you're a cop and you say, I'm this person, I'm also, it's like going undercover. 
but going undercover through a computer. So on the one hand, you're doing it for the greater good. But on the flip side, you're also lying to large numbers of people. And if you weren't a cop, doing what you're doing would be illegal. So there are lots of cases that are in this gray area. And like everything else, the gray exists on a spectrum. I think most of us in many situations would want to say that a police officer who does it for like a genuine criminal who's genuinely done something wrong. But there are other cases in which like the FBI hacks into the information of the average US citizen. And they do that under the auspices of it's for the greater good. Or they are tracking every immigrant in the country who comes in legally and reads all their, um, reads all the ingoing and outgoing numbers. So for instance, amongst other things that Snowden discovered was that there was a program in place such that if you were calling somebody outside the United States, the government was able to see what number you were calling. And so you might say, well, that's kind of for the greater good, but also it's kind of like hacking. All right. So in future weeks, we're going to talk more about hacking. And starting next week, we're going to transition more from the security to the privacy side. But that's all I really wanted to say today. Are there any more questions on this stuff? Nope. No, all right. Well, Thanks. Very interesting uh, class. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, so I will see everyone next Friday. Have a good weekend and um, have a good rest of your week or have a good next week. And I'll see you a week from now. Have a right, good one. Care. Have a good weekend, Professor.